Friends, welcome to worship. We are now on our third week uh, in the season of Advent and we continue to journey together during this season through our series Vision Quest, See More Clearly. And so for our call to worship, I'm going to read the call to worship for us and invite you to read when the, the words that are written in yellow appear uh, at the bottom of the screen later on. Into our world filled with both opportunity and disappointment, filled with both longing and despair, filled with both wealth and poverty, filled with both laughter and weeping, God comes. Divine values have always shaped creation. They shape our lives now, and they will always shape the cosmos which God values infinitely. And so we celebrate again the advent of our divine parent, our divine servant, our divine helper. And we celebrate the upside down divine perspective on prestige, status and hierarchy that is always being received around us, among us and within us. Thanks be to God. Amen. And so now we're going to light the third of our Advent candles. Let us pray. As we continue our journey through the Advent season, we pray for a new vision of divine prestige in our universe, in our society, in our relationships, and in us. We pray that we may have the humility and generosity to participate in sharing the joy that comes when we abandon the games of power and status. And so we light the candle of joy as we invite Lotta and play into our world and lives. And as we enjoy the dance of the flame, we give thanks for your divine vision of prestige that liberates us from bondage to status and leads us into the freedom of your reign. Amen. Oh, 
Please pray with me. Our world carries the scars of the way we live, Jesus. The preferential treatment given to the few who are wealthy and powerful and famous leaves the rest ignored and neglected. The desperate quest for more leaves all of us feeling less, enjoying less. The self-protective aggression we embrace to feel safe leaves us and others wounded and frightened. The apathetic disregard for the suffering, the grieving, the dying leaves us disconnected from our own humanity, from our ability to feel and to care. We need our world turned upside down, Jesus. We need our self-importance and our self-sufficiency to be undermined. We need a new way of being that is built on a whole new set of values. We pray today, humble the powerful and exalt the humble. Fill the hungry with good things and keep the satisfied from taking even more. Give us the wisdom to let a child lead us into a world of justice and love, into the joy of sacrifice and service and simplicity. O come, Emmanuel, and ransom your captive people. Amen. Jesus said, where your treasure is, there your heart will be. And when we give, we place our hearts, our lives, everything we have and everything we are in God's hands. We open ourselves to God's presence and God's spirit a little bit more. Westview's banking details are on the screen. You can use them to make your offering now or wait until the end of the video. Let's offer our whole selves to God through this act of generous giving. Hello, Westview. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you that we can always trust you. We bring before you these offerings in gratitude for all your mercies that you've given us graciously. We pray that these may be blessed and may be used for the extension of your kingdom. In Jesus Christ's name we pray, amen. Hello Westview. Today I'm reading from the New International Version from Matthew 11, verses two to 11. When John, who was in prison, heard about the deeds of the Messiah, he sent his disciples to ask him, are you the one who is to come, or should we expect someone else? Jesus replied, Go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. As John's disciples were leaving, Jesus began to speak to the crowd about John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed swayed by the wind? If not, what did you go out to see? A man dressed in fine clothes? No, those who wear fine clothes are in king's palaces. Then what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written, I will send my message ahead of you, who will prepare your way before you. Truly, I tell you, among those born of women, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Yet whoever is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Thanks be to God for his word. Friends, today we are reflecting together under the topic of divine prestige. Now, the term prestige uh, finds expressions in many ways uh, in our society, and it also has many nuances that are linked to it. 
but generally the term prestige is associated with respect as well as admiration that uh, is given for someone on the basis of their achievement, on the basis of their success, and sometimes on the basis of their status. This is often the case when we think about celebrities such as sports icons as well as movie stars. And so then it would probably be fair as we begin this reflection to say that most of us have found ourselves giving prestige uh, or prestige status to someone influential or even to people that we admire in our own lives. And so then as we reflect on the vision of divine prestige, uh, Advent invites us to actually uh, begin a reflection on what prestige is in our society, but also to seek ways to understand what the vision of divine prestige might look like. And so in this reflection, or as we begin such a reflection, we need then to ask some questions uh, to ourselves. Questions uh, that we need to ask ourselves are questions such as, why do we get so worked up over another human being simply because they are well known or even maybe because they have a lot more money than we do? Why do we insist in our society on viewing some people to be more important than other people? Why are the needs of some people prioritized and valued in our society far above the needs of others? Are we not all human beings? Are we not all born? Are we not all going to die at some point? Do we not all carry within us the image and the likeness of God? How much regret, sense of failure, and significance is experienced by amazing people around the globe simply because they do not measure up to whatever vague standards that sets apart those who we regard as being very important in our society. And lastly, how much discontent and disease is caused by this growing need for prestige, for power, and for importance in our society. And so then, my dear friends, the season of Advent gives us an opportunity to ask the question, who is truly great and what is greatness and what does it mean to be great? And so then we turn back to the scriptures as we try to respond to the question, who is truly great? We turn to the scriptures and to that uh, reading from Matthew's Gospel in chapter 11. That reading reminds us that into the Judean world of Roman dominance, into that world that uh, was filled with Pharisaic control, strict hierarchies and power struggles, into that world John the Baptist appeared. And as he appears, his preaching uh, challenged society's ideas of power, status, importance, and righteousness, but maybe also uh, the, stata, the, the ideas around prestige and what it means uh, to be great and important. It was his preaching that challenged these ideas around power, status, importance, and prestige that actually got John the Baptist to be imprisoned in one of Herod's cells. One can imagine then that it could raise questions in his mind that following what John the Baptist believed was God's way of justice and love should have led him to such humiliation of being thrown into a prison cell. But if we look at John the Baptist, we also would see that somehow he seemed to know, he seemed to understand 
that he himself was not the main event and that he himself was not the greatest. He understood himself as being just a sign pointing people towards someone greater than him. During this time or around the same time, uh, Jesus had began preaching and drawing crowds to himself. And now John needed to know if he himself, John, had completed his job and that his suffering was actually worth it. And so then John sends word to Jesus and he asked him if he was the one that John and the others were hoping for. Instead of Jesus responding to John's question and say, yes, I am that great guy that you've been waiting for and hoping for, Jesus answers or responds to John in a very classic Jesus way of responding. And as you know, Jesus is not about easy answers. Jesus never responds with easy answers. And so Jesus does not give a simple yes or no response but he responds to John's question with prophetic language to describe his ministry and he also encourages John quite strongly to keep the faith. Then Jesus asks then those around him about his cousin John. You see, here's the thing about John. John did not look, speak, or act like the celebrities of his day. In other words, John was not the greatest of preachers in his day. He was not a person of prestige or even a person of status. When we think about his clothes and his diets, we know that they were just so strange to such an extent that they were not designed to attract those who were upwardly mobile. And yet, in spite of all of this, in spite of all of this, John was able to draw a crowd. And so then, Jesus questioned his listeners about why, why is it that so many people had gone to John? In other words, Jesus questioned his followers. Why were people following this strange fellow named John? You see, while John had caused some confusion by refusing to define himself or to claim the role of a prophet or that of a messiah, Jesus identified John as the messenger who prepared the way for God's servant. And then Jesus does something. Jesus turned the status levels of his society upside down. You see, in Jesus' view of prestige, John was actually more important than the most important people in the world at the time. But in the reign of God, according to Jesus again, John also happened to be the least. Now that's the paradox. He was the most important, but he also happens to be the least. In other words, this means then that those whom the world considered prestigious were actually at the bottom of God's hierarchy. John was then somewhere above them. But the ordinary person who embraced the values as well as the priorities of God's reign and committed to a life of love and justice was more important even than John. Here's the thing, Jesus was not creating a new hierarchy of prestige in society. In fact, he was doing away with hierarchies all together. He was breaking down our human power structures and trying to show you and I that God does not value others more than others. God does not value some over others. In other words, there is no system of prestige and importance in God's world. In God's world, every human being, every non-human being, and every created thing is valuable. 
And so then, using John, this strange character, this strange preacher, this person who does not represent prestige, using him as a starting point, Jesus offers us a whole new vision of prestige and of what brings value to life. And I think the reason why Jesus does that is because Jesus recognizes that the game of prestige is a problematic game. The game of prestige is a problematic game. And so then there is a strong attraction to the system of prestige in our world. That, that is why prestige remains in our world. That is why prestige becomes something that most of us aspire for and aspire to achieve. And so then, on the one hand, when we think about prestige or the problematic game of prestige, on the one hand, there is this addictive pleasure of living vicariously through our favorite celebrities. In other words, we can enjoy their wealth, we can enjoy their opulence uh, and their lifestyle and the amazing experiences that the newspapers love to tell us about our celebrities. But it actually requires nothing of us. And so we get, we get the heat of the pleasure, but there is no cost to us, or at least we think there is no cost to us. And then on the other hand of the prestige game, we now live in a world where you and I are constantly told that any of us could suddenly ascend to the ranks of the rich and the famous, that we could be in a reality television show overnight, that we could have a social media post that goes viral and we could become influencers, that we could have a chance meeting with one of the celebrities that we adore and take a selfie with them to show off to the world that we know important people. But here's the thing, and I think this is what Jesus understood. For as long as we perpetuate this system, this game of prestige, for as long as we perpetuate this system of unequal importance, we will also continue to suffer its pain. In other words, we will struggle to resist the urge to compare ourselves to one another and to find our relative place in the prestige hierarchy. We will also fail to resist looking down on those who are seen to be below us, even if in our minds we think that we are all equal. We will also fail to resist being envious of those we believe are above us, even as we try to tell ourselves that we are content with ourselves. And yet, we will also continue to be drawn to those who find a way to opt out of this distorted vision of how the world should be. And so then, we will gaze with wonder, we will look with admiration and inspiration to people such as John the Baptist and Jesus, people who showed absolutely no desire to play the game of prestige. And so then, we will feel the longing in our hearts for a world where the humblest are valued and the humblest are treated with the same dignity as the most prominent ones. The curiosity within us towards those who ignore the power games and the longing to notice and feel the remarkable dignity in even the lowliest of God's creatures is the voice of the Spirit of God which is calling us to God's vision of a world where all people are valued, where all people are cherished, where all people are protected, where all people are seen, where all people are heard, but most importantly, a world where all people are recognized and loved. And so then, it is the voice of Christ calling us to follow his example 
of respecting all, challenging unfair advantage for some, and uplifting the least in our world. How then do we opt out of the prestige games? How do we opt out of this problematic game of prestige? I think that if we choose, if you and I choose to respond to Christ's call, we will feel the compulsion to opt out of society's prestige games. We will be drawn to follow the path that John and Jesus walked and to pay little attention to the false standards of status, power, and prestige. And whilst it can be difficult to completely opt out of such a common value in, in human affairs, there are some small actions that you and I can take to resist prestige games and to become a little more intentional about valuing everyone equally. And so then our option is to choose a different game. Our option is to choose a different game from the prestige game. This is what it means to choose a different option. That whenever you and I are tempted to worship celebrities, whenever we are tempted to live vicariously through them uh, and search for some way to become like them, we can choose instead to seek out their humanity. In other words, we can make a point of recognizing all the ways in which our celebrities and those who have prestige, status, and power are actually human just like us. We can do that by recognizing their pain and their struggles not to gloat but to extend compassion. We can acknowledge that privilege can sometimes make suffering a little bit harder. We can affirm that we all share in this complex varied human experience. In other words, we can look through the trappings and see the person inside. The other thing we can do to opt out is to practice simplicity and contentment. You see, our capitalistic system requires that we have unfulfilled needs which we try to satisfy through spending money. And one of the most effective catalysts to make us feel dissatisfied is the prestige system along with the promise that we can be anything we want to become in life. Now, it is not that we should not have aspirations. On the contrary, it is good to actually have a vision of a life and a world that motivates and inspires us, and achieving goals is one of life's greatest joys. We simply need to be careful that our aspirations do not undermine the dignity of others or cause others to lose our empathy and humanity. By intentionally practicing simplicity and contentment, we free ourselves from the world's prestige system and we embrace the upside down values of God's reign and of God's kingdom. And then we find ourselves automatically drawn to the dreams and the aspirations that connect us more deeply with our family, with our friends, and with our neighbors, and bring goodness not just to ourselves, but goodness to those around us as well. We can practice living from the truth that our wealth is not rooted in our bank balance, that our recognizability or our achievements, we can make it a spiritual practice to affirm and to celebrate that our worth and the worth of others is based in nothing other than that we are, we exist, and that we are made in God's image and God's likeness. Now friends, let me end by saying it can be tempting to interpret Jesus' teaching as creating a new prestige system 
based on turning the world's values upside down. But that's not what Jesus meant at all. Jesus rather sought to do away with prestige, with valuing some people over others. And until we learn to see the sacredness and the dignity in everyone of God's creatures, including human beings, we have not really understood the reign of God or the incarnation at all. Thank you. We will now uh, be led in a moment of response by Nicole. As we reflect on this week's message, let's just for a moment have a look at the Advent candle. I'm going to allow a short silence now for us to get focused. And I'd like you to engage with that candle. Give time for God to speak to you as you reflect on the message. Make a note of what has happened as God has spoken to you today. And then as we continue after this in song, let the message sink in. Let's be quiet and then we continue in song. Thank you, Nicole. And so, friends, now we share in the words of benediction. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all, now and evermore. Amen. Go, friends, into the world. And as you go into the world, may you value each and every person that you encounter. In Jesus' name.